for money. Maybe money is the kind of thing that makes a person transparent uh, as opposed to uh, uh, less transparent, so you can't hide as well as to what your values really are in the presence of money. Uh, maybe money is um, not something that um, can be blamed for overcoming appropriate values, but actually brings out the values of the person who possesses it. Uh, it's a possibility as well. <coughs> Uh, I want to suggest that money is inherently and profoundly social. Uh, it has no function except socially. Uh, it is a medium of social uh, exchange. It is not self-oriented uh, in its nature. In fact, its whole value, I would suggest, is essentially a social thing, not an individual thing. I, I could pull out the piece of paper and give it as much value as I want to, but it would be meaningless unless you agree some way. So I want to suggest that money is inherently and profoundly a social instrument, not an individualistic instrument. Um, I'm not convinced uh, that money necessarily corrupts. Maybe it's the case that people corrupt money. Maybe that uh, they use money in, uh, in corrupting ways that, as I said, uh, may reveal their values uh, more than their values are shaped by the money. Uh, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but uh, uh, think about its possibilities. It may just be that um, uh, people uh, abuse the instrument that we're talking about as opposed to themselves being corrupted by it. This is a possibility. Um, okay, we get back to the speech itself. One of the lines you'll see in the book is, unless and, until and unless you discover that money is the root of all good, you ask for your own destruction. Well, we certainly get Rand's view of things. Money is not the root of all evil. In fact, money is the root of all good. Well, that's paradoxical too, in a way, isn't it? I mean, we've given some reasons why money might be, might be bad, so I want to explore a moment uh, why she wants to make this kind of claim that, in fact, money is the root of all good. Okay? Seems a bit strong. Um, but anyway, seem to me to be trying to explain what she's saying in the speech, seem to be two principles that are associated uh, with money. One is wealth and the other is free exchange. And to take wealth first, um, I mean essentially and predominantly, uh, you know, you need a productive surplus in order for money to exist. If you're in abject poverty, uh, really you're just scraping by, you're trying to uh, grow or whatever, find enough to keep yourself going, not really much need uh, for money. Okay? Uh, but money does, um, does seem to appear as people get wealthier, both historically in human communities and otherwise. So there seems to be some connection between wealth and money. As wealth grows, uh, the utility of money increases, its value uh, increases, its use increases, okay? So typically you might find a, a stage theory of history which says, well, we begin essentially you know, within our own family, just growing enough food to keep us alive and so forth. And then we produce a little surplus and what happens? Well, the first thing we do with that surplus is we barter. Uh, you know, I'll give you this much of my crop if you give me a little of that. And then we get from bartering into beginning use of money. Sometimes it's commodity goods. Uh, some good sir, turns out and throughout human history, there have been all sorts of things from seashells to salt to, of course, gold and silver. Uh, as being money, but these things tend to arise as wealth arises. So it suggests that maybe there's some connection uh, between money and wealth. Uh, so I, I put it in the, in the reverse, poverty and money don't uh, generally appear together. Sometimes though, if they do appear together, uh, you, might, uh, be, you might actually have a case of exploitation. Uh, this is sort of the typical uh, image maybe of Latin America with abject poverty on one part of town and absolute fabulous wealth on the other, well, maybe there was exploitation. We can't uh, necessarily rule that possibility out. Um, I think uh, money is very much connected to freedom of choice. The less choice you have in what you do, the less real need there is for money. And just go to the opposite extreme here. If I'm the dictator and I can tell you what to do about everything, it's really not a lot of reason for you to have money, right? I mean, what, what good does it do? I'm going to tell you how you're supposed to behave and when you're supposed to do it and how you're supposed to do it. Seems like there's not much need for money in that sort of situation. 
But as people become freer, as they have more choices, well, money seems to be a much more interesting commodity then because it's a way for me to express a number of the choices that I now have, okay? So money is a kind of medium of choice, if you will. Uh, it allows me to do a number of things that I couldn't do otherwise and becomes an essential, essentially more valuable as choice is open to me because uh, the money allows me to uh, actually enjoy some of the many choices that face me and, and, uh, and to uh, prioritize those choices. Um, if you look at the speech itself, uh, I went through it again and sort of marked off the, the passages. I came up with uh, sort of three great values that the speech in the book tries to uh, talk about and then uh, corresponding vices that uh, it, it talks about as well. Uh, the first value that uh, is connected to money in, in Rand's mind is production, uh, secondly exchange, uh, and finally, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it respect. Okay? Uh, the last term is not actually her word, but uh, I think captures uh, a number of things she says in, in the speech there. The opposite, the vices, uh, the contraries are, if you will, uh, what she calls looting or fraud, exploitation in some sense, okay, uh, which is the opposite of production. Uh, instead of exchange, the opposite uh, would be coercion. Uh, and then finally, um, indifference uh, and disrespect. Okay? Uh, what Rand's claim is, and again, you can agree or disagree, but she's trying to say in this speech that money societies actually promote those three values of production, exchange, and respect, and non-money, uh, centrally directed societies actually promote those vices of looting, uh, coercion, and indifference or disrespect. Okay? Uh, again, you can evaluate uh, that uh, for your own. So I'm going to sort of go through each of these uh, very quickly and talk about what I think she's trying to say about the connection. So first, of course, is uh, production and money. And as, as I just said, um, money seems to be the product of, um, of a productive surplus of some sort. As, as wealth expands, the money becomes more important, more useful, and actually helps create uh, further value and further wealth. Um, wealth and money are not identical. And this was what Tom started with uh, in his talk uh, before, the old mercantilist fallacy, if I pile a lot of gold up, that necessarily makes me wealthier. Well, it doesn't necessarily make me wealthier if I've been over in Mexico and Peru killing Incas and, and Aztecs, you know, and just simply haul their gold over to Spain, well, that doesn't make me any wealthier. Uh, really, at least uh, the overall amount of wealth has not been increased, somebody else has been diminished. So I don't want to confuse the two. What I want to say is that they are connected, however. Real wealth and real money can be connected. So I put those two together. Um, as I say, money depends on wealth. Wealth doesn't depend on money. Um, 